What's happening, Big Talk Nation? Melissa and Roger Adkins coming at you from Moorhead City, North Carolina for our second episode of Melissa and Roger's Wildlife. And we once, want to once again extend a huge heartfelt thank you to our buddies John and Jordan for giving us this incredible opportunity and welcoming us into the Big Talk family. And I am really excited about today's episode because we actually have the privilege and pleasure of interviewing my guitar teacher, Fred. Yeah, this is going to be a fun one, and later this evening we'll be watching Fred perform with the Wizards of Winter here at the Crystal Coast Civic Center. Before we jump into our questions, we're going to give Fred an opportunity to introduce himself to some of our listeners who may or may not be familiar with his resume. So if you will, Fred, just state your name, instrument, how long you've been with Wizards of Winter, and any other musical projects you're currently involved with. Certainly. It's fr first of all, it's my privilege and pleasure to be with you two. Um, you guys came down last year and we had a great time, of course. Uh, my name is Fred Gorhow. I play guitar for the Wizards of Winter. I also co-write the songs with Scott Kelly, who's the founder and owner of the band. Um, I've been with them for 15 years now. This is my 15th year, 15th year touring. And uh, it started off as kind of like a charity thing. We were originally a Trans-Siberian Orchestra tribute band. And of course, I love TSO, so I loved being part of it. And we were we were just doing... Uh, benefits for like the local food pantry and stuff like that and then the following year we booked more gigs and people started asking us you know where can we buy your album and we didn't have one so we started writing songs and now we're three studio albums and one live album in, into this and so it's, it's going great I, I also play guitar for Ted Poley from Danger Danger and I've been in some metal bands and stuff like that back in the day, but uh, that's kind of my resume, and I'm happy to be here. Awesome. Love it, Thank yes, you. yes. And um, Ted's band was actually how we first met each other, was on the Monsters of Rock Cruise 2022. And for anybody who um, has not been, it is an awesome experience. Roger and I would highly recommend going. Um, just great time all around. Um, so let's go ahead and jump right in and get started. So how old were you when you first began playing guitar and how long would you say it took you to become proficient? I'm going to say I was about 12. I'm still working on being proficient, but <laughs> I started off listening to lear learning Kiss songs was my big thing. And then I got into ACDC and um, then all of a sudden 1978 uh, Van Halen 1 came out. And that was a game changer. And I was like, what is this sound that's coming out of the speakers? And Eddie Van Halen, of course, changed the world for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I was into a band called Rainbow, and I was really liking them a lot. And their guitar player, Richie Blackmore, was awesome. And I found out at the time that Richie had previously been in a band called Deep Purple. And, you know, I was a kid, so I didn't know about Deep Purple. They, they came out when I was a baby, an infant. So um, I... I back you know looked up all their catalogs so that's that's kind of like where I got my start and then UFO and then all the 80s bands you know all the 80s hair bands and you know Slaughter and Motley Crue and everybody you know awesome yeah who were your greatest well you've already covered your greatest musical influences and like what got you started I would, I would say probably Richie Blackmore Michael Shanker, Eddie Van Halen, Ingve, of course, I love Ingve. Yeah. Um, there's so many, but probably the first one was Ace Frehley. Seeing, seeing Kiss in Madison Square Garden, 1977, when I was in sixth grade, that was like, oh my God. And the opening band was Piper, and the lead singer for Piper at that time was Billy Squire, who eventually went on to be Billy Squire. Yeah. That's the second interview that we have had somebody mention Piper, actually. Really? So, yeah. Great band. <laughs> great band. From, you know, and I remember them. I remember that. That's it's going back a few years, but I definitely remembered liking them. Of course, I was there to see Kiss. My dad brought me to Madison Square Garden to see oh, Kiss. And, uh, you know, but I was like, I enjoyed them. They were, they were good. So seeing Ace on stage, was that like what really just sealed the deal? You're like, oh, I want to yeah. do that. Yeah, he was the coolest guy in the world. Uh, Les Paul three pickups, the smoking guitar, and of course all the flames and the great songs. Oh, you know? yes. Kiss is timeless and they will forever be around. Everything circles back to yeah. this. It does. <laughs> totally, 
So how old were you when you attended your first concert? Was that that I was one? Twelve. Your... That was okay. my first. Concert. That was your first okay. one. Okay, that's that's awesome. And then then my parents wouldn't let me go by myself for a couple of years. So there was, I went to see in eighth grade. I was finally able to go to a concert by myself, eighth or eighth or ninth, and I went to see Judas Priest and Iron Maiden, and that's when Paul Deano was singing for them. It was on the Iron Maiden Killers Tour and Judas Priest Point of Entry. And Maiden came out and they were the greatest band I think I could have ever seen in my life. And of course, since Judas Priest was headlining, they came on and I was like, oh my God, how could they possibly be any better? <laughs> so, and I've, I've been hooked ever since. Awesome. So, you've listed some good ones so far. What's the favorite concert you've attended? Um. Wow, that's a tough. One. I just recently went to see Jeff Lynne's ELO, mm -hmm. okay, and because I've loved ELO since they came out. My cousin got the ELO album. I was into Kiss. He was into ELO, and I, you know, begrudgingly admitted that the songs were great. Oh yeah. Um, so I've been a closet ELO fan <laughs> since then. But seeing that, I maybe it's because it's my most recent actual big concert. But that was amazing. Um, Van Halen on the Monsters of Rock tour with Doc and Metallica, Scorpions, Kingdom Come. That was a, an amazing, amazing experience. There have been so many. It would be tough for me to pick a favorite. If I had to pick a favorite, I'd probably say, I would have to say Kiss 77 because that was my first one. And that's what kind of lit the fire and I haven't stopped. It's either the biggest blessing in my life or the biggest curse, <laughs> one or the other. It's music, so it's blessing. Yes. <laughs> Is there one band that you wish that you had had the opportunity to see? Oh, God, yeah. Or multiple. Dio. 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 I never saw Ronnie James Dio. I would have loved to see him with Rainbow or Dio. And any time he played, there were a couple of instances where I could have gotten to see them, and it just didn't work out. And when I did have tickets to see Ozzy and Def Leppard when Randy was playing, and um, I got punished. My parents wouldn't let me go. So I missed Randy. And then I saw them, I think it was a few months later or maybe the following year with Brad Gillis playing. Okay. Uh, but that was without Def Leppard. So I'm, I'm tempted to think it was the next tour. Gotcha. But it's going way back. <laughs> so who was your greatest supporter when you first stepped out into the world of entertainment? My dad. Dad. My dad was awesome. I remember I had a paper route and I had a cheap, crappy, crappy guitar with the strings like an inch off the fretboard and, and I had a paper route and I was saving my money and they had a, a Les Paul copy. It was made by Hondo and it looked just like Ace Frehley's because it was a Les Paul copy. So I found it in this music store and... I think I had $140 and the guitar was $199. So my dad brought me to the store and he's like, if, if, if it's nice enough, I'll lend you the rest of the money. So I'm playing it and he goes, wait a second. He goes, this one's $199 and this one is $685. Now keep in mind, this is 1981, 1982. And I said, oh, that's because that's a Gibson Les Paul. It's a Gibson Les Paul custom. And he goes, so why is it so much more money? I said, it's just, you know, quality build, everything, all that stuff. So I'm playing the Hondo through, like, this amp and playing awfully, I'm sure. And so the, the music store owner comes over and takes the, the Les Paul down. He goes, try this and see what you think of it. So I tried it, and I was like, yeah, it's fantastic. And my dad's like, what do you think of that one? I'm like... Yeah, but I don't have enough money. He goes, it's already paid for. Pay me back. Took me three years paper route money to pay him back, but he lent me that money. And so he, he always encouraged me. He was always into it. He never came to see me live because he was always working. Um, but he did after my mom died was the first time he came to see me live. And then so it was um, went full circle. So, yeah, he's he's responsible for it. Brought me to see Kiss and then lent me, what, probably five hundred dollars after taxes to get the actual Gibson Les Paul so I was like forget it so sorry for being long-winded but that's, no, that's awesome. no, he's that's the guy beautiful. he's the guy that supported me so God that's, bless you I miss him that's awesome 
What's the best and worst part about being on the road as an entertainer? The best part is playing. Um, there's very few worst parts, but the waiting around, there's a lot of hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Now you got to wait. So um, Greg Smith, the bass player, mm -hmm. bass player for everybody, um, <laughs> he says it best. He says, I play for free. I get paid to do all the other stuff, all the waiting and all the traveling. So, and that makes perfect sense to me because we love playing. It's just everything, getting from one place to the other and you know, getting set up. Our crew is amazing. They set everything up, um, tear everything down. We just get to show up and play. But there's a lot of waiting around and, you know, a lot of travel, truck sure. stops and all that stuff. Sure. Yeah. So what's the key to allowing your musical influences that you mentioned earlier to shine through in your craft while still simultaneously ensuring that you develop your own unique sound? I think I was lucky in the respect that when I was coming up and learning that it was almost impossible to learn everything note for note. If I was trying to learn Eddie Van Halen stuff, like if you want to learn Eddie Van Halen stuff now, there's a YouTube and there's um, all these guitar programs that'll slow it down to a, you know a fraction of what your you know what the actual speed is, and you can you can learn it note for note and then slowly gradually speed it up. So when I had to learn it, I I would learn what I thought he was doing, which wasn't a hundred percent correct. It was my best interpretation, and that kind of helped me to develop my own style. I'm sure that the guys that I listen to come through in my playing but it also sounds like me I've, I've had people come up and say yeah, I knew it was you sir, as soon as I heard you playing which is a huge compliment because yeah. you know I wouldn't notice it but you know that's my style that's how I do it but I, th I think it's because I was lucky enough to grow up in a time when you know you, you had to you had to pick it off at full top speed you know what I mean either you, you know move the needle on the record or st you know press stop and play play on the on the cassette so it was it was a little a little different trying to learn stuff back then sure. in the olden times <laughs> <laughs> before dial up internet <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, what's your favorite song to play and why oh god that's a hard one we'll ask you some hard ones sometimes <laughs> um Right now, I'm going to say Crazy Nights by Danger Danger because I love the solo. It's such a killer solo. And it took me a little while to learn it because Andy Timmons is a beast of a mm -hmm. guitar player. Um, so right now, <clears throat> and it, it, it probably changes, you know, because there's sometimes where I'll be driving around and I'll just play that same song, whatever song it is at the time, a thousand times, over and over and over. You get a brain, you know. Ted will come up and go, yeah, I want to do this song. And then maybe I haven't heard it in years or haven't heard it at all. And so I'll be like, I have to become familiar with the song before I actually sit down to try to learn it. Sure. So right now it's probably Crazy Nights. Awesome. awesome. In any group you've been affiliated with, have there been any songs that you played for an audience and the reaction wasn't exactly what you expected, like in terms of it being a bigger hit than you anticipated or maybe receiving an underwhelming reaction to a song that you really loved performing? Absolutely. Actually, in, in this band, in the Wizards of Winter, there's a song called Midnight Noel. Mm -hmm. And it was a kind of, not, I wouldn't call it a throwaway, but it, to us it was an album track. Yeah. We figured it was an album track. You know, it just, it wasn't what we would consider releasing as a single. And the first time we played it live, the audience stood up and started clapping and, and just really got into it and we were blown away so that's a staple in our set always and it's always a crowd favorite it's a lot of fun and and that kind of took us by surprise we that's were awesome. expecting maybe something else was going to be the the one that grabbed everybody but this one did very cool cool do you have any routines and tips tricks that you swear by that go and keep you at the top of your game any of the trade secrets um i try not to eat closer than three hours before the show. Okay. On an early show like today, it's almost impossible. Lunch is at two o'clock. Sure. Yeah. Um, sound check went a little over, um, so I had to eat closer than three hours. So I, I modified what I do, but I don't want to end up feeling like I need a nap while I'm getting ready to get on stage. <laughs> um, make sure I loosen up because just like anything, it's it's like exercising. You know, if you don't loosen up, you know, you're not going to really hurt yourself. You're going to what? 
throw a finger. It's not going to happen. <laughs> but you, you won't be up to up to par for maybe two or three songs if you don't loosen up. You know, maybe I'm not prepared. I don't have the speed. My, um, you know, my right hand and left hand aren't synced up perfectly right from the get go. So you warm up for you know five six minutes before. And I usually do that on the side of the stage before we go on. You know, make sure I loosen up a little bit. I used to play for you know a half hour forty five minutes backstage, but the, you don't always have time to do that. Sure. So. Very fair. So what is the secret to becoming fully comfortable and confident in front of an audience? Doing it thousands of times. People ask me if I get nervous. I never get nervous anymore. <clears throat> um, I, I'm always anxious and excited to do it. My, my first gig with Ted Poley was on the pool deck at Monsters of Rock Cruise. He had asked me to join the band and I said yes. And uh, the Wizards was getting ready to go out on tour. And he announced it on Thanksgiving, and I was leaving the following day to go on tour with the Wizards. And we had a, a show booked, but it was after the cruise, because at that that year the cruise, I think, was in February. Mm -hmm. I think it was the first one after COVID. And so he said, oh, my God, we got th literally three days before, I think, L.A. Guns had to cancel. And mm -hmm. so he called me up on Friday and said, do you want to go on the cruise? And I was like, well, yeah. So he goes, well, we, we only prepared like a 35-minute set because we were opening for, I think, Skid Row. And he's like, well, we got to do an hour, so here's a list of all the songs. I never rehearsed with him. Actually, I played with him one time on my audition, and then we never played together again. Wow. And he said, here's the rest of the songs. Here's an hour's worth of material. We'll do a room rehearsal on the boat, which we did. And here we go, that's it. And that was my first show with him. And when we first went on, I was a little bit concerned because there was nobody out there. Mm -hmm. Kix was playing on the other end of the boat, so everybody was <laughs> at the Kix <laughs> yeah. show. And once we did a quick sound check slash line check, then all of a sudden people started pouring in because I guess Kix had finished. Mm -hmm. And then it was packed. And But that was my first show with Ted Poley. So make sure you know your material. Absolutely. Make sure you're prepared. Make sure you go on stage sober and you're good. Good. Good advice. That's solid. Have you played any locations or venues that have stood out big time that became favorites? Or is everything kind of just a blur at this point? Um, Monsters of Rock Cruise is pretty awesome. I have to say that. So anytime I get to do that, I've done it a couple of times. Um, so that's always good. Um, yeah, we play a lot of cool theaters with the wizards so a lot of them kind of look the same and I'm like what's the name of that place what's the name of that place and I really like a lot of them um, doing the the rainbow and the summer bash just this past year uh, was great you know it was packed it was awesome with the bullet boys and accept and KK's priest so that was a great time you know but there's there's so many that it's tough for one to stand out um, yeah, that's probably... I like Penn's Peak a whole lot in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. I like Starland Ballroom in Jersey. That's a great, great venue. Mm -hmm. Nice and big, great sound, you know. Even great in-house production, even if you're not on tour and you're not bringing your own stuff. Yeah. Excellent. So what would you say um, the most crucial components that go into a song that help elicit an emotional response that's felt rather than something that's just heard? <sighs> I've never written a top 10 hit song, so <laughs> I might not be the guy to ask it, but what I try to do is I try to write something that I want to hear, something that I like. Okay. There's a lot of people that like the same kind of music that I like, so if it's something that I like, then there's a good chance that maybe somebody else will like it too, you know what I mean? In addition to making sure it's structured correctly, you know, whether it's going to be intro, verse, chorus, pre-chorus, you know, however you want to do it. Um, make sure it's it's not too overly drawn out. Get to the hook, you know, things like that. Try and try and be cognizant of that. But for the most part, I want to make sure that the song's got a pulse and it's something that I like, so that people that like the same kind of music that I like will probably like it too. Good, that okay. makes sense. Yeah. Did you ever become discouraged as an artist due to certain trends that were happening in All the, the industry? Time. All the time. What helped you keep pushing through and like staying with it? Guitar's been my friend since I'm 12 years old. It's gotten me through everything, you know. Any 
trials and tribulations that life tosses at you, whether it's the loss of a pet, loss of a parent, loss of a love interest, or a fight within one band and you're in another band, or just anything, you know, job sucks, or I had an accident with my car, or I lost my ATM card, now I can't get money out until Monday when they open, you know, whatever the scenario is, guitar has kind of always been there. Pretty deep, huh? <laughs> <laughs> so, what would you say is the reason music has the ability to unify such a diverse group of people while most other aspects of life tend to cause divide? I think because it triggers an emotional response. You can actually, it, the best songwriters are able to paint a picture mm -hmm. with the sounds that you hear, and I'm still trying to do that. Um, but the best songwriters, the best composers, and in you know classical and music history have been able to do that you can trigger an emotion if you can do that then you're well on your way awesome what would you say your biggest obstacle is that you faced and how did you overcome it um i haven't really had big giant obstacles and That's people <laughs> yeah, people people in my life have, have been pretty supportive of what i do and maybe that's just because that's what you project out to the universe and then you're going to get that back. Mm -hmm. If you allow negative people into your space, you're just going to receive negativity. So I, I've been pretty fortunate. I, I can't say that I had this one awful, horrible diversity that I overcame. I'm, I, you know, I'm not a superhero at all in that respect. I've been very lucky. Good. Well, good. that's what we like yeah. to hear. <laughs> <laughs> no stories are good stories sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but speaking of stories, we thought that this question might make for some interesting stories. Have you ever been injured on stage? No, but I've gotten sick. Oh. Yes, I, I got... And, and that's happened a few times. You know, I won't go into details, but, you know... I'm sure you know, it's equally as hard to play through that. Yeah, <laughs> because when you're... A, you, you don't want somebody seeing anything coming out of your mouth when you're, you know, right. on stage. And that's... I've been in that scenario where I've had to run off at the last song and things like that. Yeah. But, but you got to play. You're sick, you're sick. Mm -hmm. You know, it's happened in... Yeah, probably three or four times in my entire life. Maybe, maybe seven, eight years ago with the Wizards we were out. And we have two buses because we travel with 20 people. And one bus went down, the next bus went down, and we were all sick at some point in time. Mm. And we had to cancel a couple of shows because of it, which was a nightmare. But uh, you got to keep going. Sure. What's your proudest moment as an artist? Probably seeing my kids in the audience and having them come back and tell me they were proud of me that I did great. That's probably the the best feeling I could ever get. That's awesome. So sweet. Love it. What advice or recommendations do you have for aspiring artists attempting to make it in the industry today, particularly those who are unsure of the best way to get started and put themselves out there? Just play everywhere you can and keep playing. You're going to get knocked down. You're going to make mistakes live, especially. There's going to be, don't stop. Don't panic play through it and pick it up you know and just keep playing just you know pick up that guitar or pick up those drumsticks or turn on your keyboard whatever you're doing pick up your violin pick up your saxophone your flute whatever you play and make sure you do it every day if you could do it every day even if it's five minutes it's better than doing it for nine hours twice a month mm -hmm. you know every day because you'll, you'll, that muscle memory kicks in and then you'll start realizing that you start to do things without thinking about them as opposed to trying to do it. And then, then that's it. So I would just say just keep going. You know, don't get discouraged because you will, uh, the amount of times I wanted to launch my guitar through a window, I couldn't even tell you. <laughs> but that's your best friend. <laughs> it, it, it is. But that's why I never did. But You uh, have fights with your best friend sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Is there one thing about your band or projects that you're working on that you'd like more of your fans to know about? Um, well, that's, that's one to think about. Probably they do know because most bands are very, very tight-knit, you know what I mean? Especially ones when you're on tour because you live with them. You know, you live with them on the road. Yeah. On the bus, you know, we sleep in bunks. 
most of the time occasional hotel rooms but when you're sleeping on bunks you know there's there's 12 bunks on each bus so you're you know on top of each other literally there there's two rows of three on both sides of the bus so it's six and six and you you're literally sleeping on top of each other in a bunk so and you do everything together you're hanging out together you're eating breakfast and lunch and dinner together you play together and then you travel together and you walk into the truck stop together to get a cup of coffee or in my case red bull and cashews <laughs> cashews those that's my drug of choice these days red bull and cashews that's the real secret to it. Yes. being successful. <laughs> <laughs> so, so just a very close knit family. It's gonna yeah, and any band is is a family, and in, in, in essence, it really is because you deal with each other a, a lot. There's a whole lot of time spent together, whether it's creating, performing, traveling, just living. You know, sure. it's it's a family. Absolutely. So what's the best way that you found to diffuse conflict with bandmates, crew personnel, venue staff, etc., in situations where tensions are running high? Check your freaking ego at the door. We're performers, so we all like to show off. I don't care anybody tells you they don't, they're lying. We're all performers, we all have an ego, and we all like to show off, and we all want it to be about us as much as possible can't always be focused on you but we want our moment mm -hmm. so sometimes you need to check your ego and realize that you know what this may not be my moment because I got another one coming up after that or whatever the scenario is a piece that you're coming up with that you wanted to add to a song that you're writing that everybody else is not really feeling it you know what I mean so sometimes you got to think about other people's approach and think maybe I could be wrong okay good very, very I good. wish I could do that, but that's what I would tell everybody else. <laughs> uh, um, what elements would you say are key to a lasting, successful musical career? Oh wow! And you've been with other other people team. liking it. You know what I mean? If other people like your music, that's gonna obviously. If, if nobody's coming, and they stop coming, um, it's pretty much done. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've I've been very fortunate with the Wizards. You know because we're a very niche kind of a market it's a Christmas thing so we have a lot of people that come see us year in year out you know what I mean they've made a tradition and I've seen some some people have come 10 12 14 years in a row they come to see us and, and they'll travel long distances to do it you guys drove four and a half five hours to get here today um, so I can't tell you the appreciation I have for that um, so if you can touch people and have them want to come see you again, mm -hmm. not just like, oh yeah, I saw him, it was great, and you know, I'll never go see him again, but you know, I enjoyed it. If you can make them want to come back, you know, leave them wanting more. Sure. I think that's an, an adage, you know, always leave them wanting some more, like, oh my God, I wish they kept playing, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Then they'll come back and see you again. Awesome. So this one, you may have a couple of different answers since you're with different groups, but um, who's the biggest joker or prankster of the bunch? Um, wow. <laughs> well, Ted Poley is absolutely a blast to be around. You know, he's, wind him up and watch him go. You know yeah. what I mean? He's fantastic <laughs> and he's entertaining all the time. With the Wizards, I would say, Everybody's. I mean, we just constantly joke all the time. If, if I said it's Steve Brown, or if I said it was Greg Smith, or I said it was Guy Lemonier, or Tony Gaynor, or me, I would be lying because we all keep each other in stitches. It's, it's constant laughing to the point sometimes where we're crying. We laugh so hard, which is it's the greatest time ever. It oh, really yeah. is. That's awesome. Um, what is one main impression that you want to leave fans with today? and you hope that will always be part of your musical legacy. That I really appreciate them, because without them, we are nothing. We could put on the best production show with the greatest sound, but if nobody's there to hear it and see it, it doesn't mean anything. Did it really happen? You know, like if a tree falls and nobody's there to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. So any other fun facts or stories you would like to share with us before we let oh, you go? Oh, wow, ahead? that's... That got me... Things that I probably can't say, but <laughs> I think we'll leave it at that. I don't. I don't. I, I don't want to plead the fifth. That's yeah, fine. I, plead the fifth. <laughs> you know I mean, well, you just play it. guitar. You just play guitar, right? Yeah, I, I, I just play guitar. There's. I, it's tough for me to think of one 
that, you know, nothing recently that I would just be like, listen, we laughed constantly, but, you know, years ago there were probably things that I probably shouldn't talk about, but we'll leave it at that. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking your time to sit down with us today, and we really, really appreciate it. Well, thank you guys so much for having me, and uh, can't wait for you to see the show tonight. We're yeah. going to hang afterwards, right? Absolutely. Of course. Awesome. Absolutely. Anyone near Moorhead City, North Carolina, come out to the Crystal Coast Civic Center this evening to see the Wizards of Winter. These guys hit the stage at 4, and we promise you won't want to miss it. And thank you, as always, to our listeners tuning in today for this episode of Melissa and Roger's Wildlife. We hope you'll join us again soon. Be safe out there, and remember to be excellent to each other. Much love to you all. See you next time.